الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم التي هي أحسن رب شهل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I welcome all the viewers on the PCV network as well as the various people watching us on the social media platforms that is YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram as well as the people watching us live on the Al Hidayah platform I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you Inshallah we'll be starting with the session Ask Sheikh Farik, Season 8, Session 4. So let's start with the question answer session. Let's take the first question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Harun Rashid from Kashmir. Is it permissible to be a student of a non Muslim as far as worldly knowledge is concerned? Knowledge can broadly be classified into two categories. The first is the worldly knowledge and the second is the knowledge of the deen, the knowledge of our religion of Islam. As far as worldly knowledge is concerned, it is permissible to study worldly knowledge under a non-Muslim or to have a non-Muslim teacher as far as acquiring worldly knowledge is concerned. But you should see to it that Whatever the teacher teaches or whatever the non-Muslim teaches, it does not go against the basic teachings of Islam. It does not go against the glorious Quran and the authentic teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. You should see to it that this point is considered. That what the non-Muslim teaches, it doesn't go against the basic teachings of Islam. And also, Whenever you're acquiring knowledge from someone, you should see to that that person, he is knowledgeable as far as that field is concerned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Suratul Nahl chapter number 16, verse number 43, and Suratul Anbiya chapter number 21, verse number 7, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That if you do not know, ask the person who knows. And especially, we find that it is common that most of the children they go to convent schools some go to convent schools, some go to Christian, Christian schools the parents should see to it that they admit their children into Islamic schools and when a child for example if he's in the first grade, second grade, even if he's studying worldly knowledge from a non-Muslim teacher, for example, English, for example, science, for example, maths or any other subject, the worldly knowledge, there are chances that in these convent schools he may learn certain things which may go against the teachings of Islam. For example, we find that in the convent schools, when a child he goes to any convent school, for example, in grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, etc., even if the teacher is teaching him English, yet the teacher may make certain statements, for example, Oh Jesus! Or when he goes in the morning to the school, they may have a particular kind of prayer which, in which they call Jesus as God or they call upon Jesus. And we find this that this is very common in the convent schools. And we find this in India as well. In the convent schools, this is very common. So the parents should take utmost precaution that when they admit their children, they should see to that they admit their children into Islamic schools. And especially when the child is young, for example, he's in grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 or grade 4, it is very important that he studies even worldly knowledge from a Muslim teacher. Because a child who is small, he may not be able to decipher what is allowed, what is not allowed in Islam 
and the teacher may say certain things which may go against the basic teachings of Islam and the student will accept it because when a student is small he may not know the basic teachings of Islam he may not know everything what is halal he may not know everything what is haram so the parents play a key role here that this they should see to it that they admit their children into Islamic schools and even if the child is learning education worldly knowledge from a non-muslim teacher especially if the child is in primary school so it should be taken care that the child does not learn even worldly education from a non-muslim teacher because it could have effects on his theme but generally acquiring worldly knowledge from a non-muslim it is permissible as long as it does not go against the teachings of the glorious Quran and against the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad may peace and blessings be upon him as you go higher in the initial stages when you are in grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 there are high chances that the teacher may say something and the student may accept it and may not be able to decipher what is right and what is wrong as far as the deed is concerned but when you go higher for example grade 10 for example in grade 10 or for example you are studying bachelor's you are studying masters in this situation if the teacher is a non-muslim and if he's teaching worldly knowledge and if you have the basic knowledge of islam what is halal what is haram then inshallah you will be able to decipher what is right and what is wrong and you can only accept that what the teacher says is correct and if the teacher is telling anything against the teachings of the glorious quran or authentic hadith you should avoid standing under such a teacher the second type of knowledge is the knowledge of the deen as far as knowledge of the deen is concerned the knowledge of the religion of Islam of our religion of our deen we should only acquire it from Muslims as far as the knowledge of deen is concerned we should not acquire it from non-Muslims we should avoid keeping non-Muslim teachers as far as learning about our deen is concerned as far as the Islamic education is concerned this is very important and we should go to a person who is an expert or a specialist in that particular field if we want to acquire knowledge in a particular field for example if you want to acquire knowledge or if you want to learn about fiqh so you will go to a faqih you will go to a teacher or to a scholar who is an expert in the field of fiqh if you want to know or learn something about tafsir you will go to a mufassir so the knowledge of the deen it should only be acquired from a Muslim and we find this that it is common especially in the Western countries that many of the students those who are doing PhD in any Islamic field for example in Tafsir or in Hadith or in any other Islamic field their guide or their Mushrif is a non-Muslim and they think that it is very okay a non-Muslim who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does not believe in the teachings of Islam how can he teach you about Islam how can he teach you something which he does not believe in I'm not saying that it is haram to study PhD or to have a guide a non-Muslim guide but why to have a non-Muslim guide when he is not believing in Islam when he does not believe in the teachings of Islam therefore you should try your level best even if you are studying PhD many people say that he's just a guide he's just showing us the way how to write a thesis etc but yet in this situation you never know he may say certain things against Islam or against the teachings of Islam and you may get influence so therefore even in this situation you should try your level best that you take a Muslim guide and as far as the worldly knowledge is concerned if you have an option of acquiring the worldly knowledge from a Muslim or from a non-Muslim and both of them they are equally qualified 
So in this situation, you should prefer a Muslim over a non-Muslim. Because when you are studying with a Muslim, generally you do not have to be on your guard always and you do not have to take excessive precaution. But when you are studying with a non-Muslim or if a non-Muslim is your teacher, you have to take excessive precaution that you do not acquire or learn anything from him that is against the teachings of Islam. So I hope that answers your question. We will take the next question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Noor Shehu. I am a civil servant from Abuja, Nigeria. I heard a hadith saying that in the end, it is not our good deeds that will take us to Jannah, but Allah's mercy. Even though it is mentioned several times in the glorious Quran, those who believe and do righteous deeds will enter Jannah. Is it so? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran regarding Iman and Amalus Salihat Inna alladheena amanu wa amilus salihat walladheena amanu wa amilus salihat alladheena amanu wa amilus salihat Iman along with righteous deeds it is mentioned in the glorious Quran no less than 50 times in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 25 in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 82 in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 277 in Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 verse number 57 in Surah Al-Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 57 no less than 50 times Iman along with Amal Salihat that is mentioned and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Kahf chapter number 18 verse number 107 إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ نُزُلًا That those who believe and do righteous deeds, they are aboard, it will be Jannat al-Firdaus. So the two important criteria for a person to enter Jannah, for a person to be successful, for a person to enter Jannah, he needs to have Iman and he needs to do righteous deeds, that is good deeds. The first and the foremost thing is Iman, which is the fundamental and the basis of Islam. A person, he may do several good deeds, several righteous deeds, but if he does not have Iman, all of his good deeds are useless. So Iman and as well as doing righteous deeds, doing good deeds is very important. And the criteria to enter Jannah, it is mentioned in the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Asr. Chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3. Wal asr, by time, in al insan alafi khusr, verily man is in a state of loss. Illa ladina amanu, except for those who believe. Wa amilu salihat, and do righteous deeds. Wa tawa sobil haq, exhort people towards truth that is doing dawa. Wa tawa sobil sabr, exhort people towards patience and perseverance. Minimum four criteria are required for a person to enter Jannah. The first is iman. The second is Amal al-Salihat, that is righteous deeds. The third is Wa Tawasab al-Haq, exhorting people towards truth, that is doing da'wah. And the fourth is Wa Tawasab al-Sabr, exhorting people towards patience and perseverance. So these are four criteria for a person to enter Jannah. And in this verse of Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stressed upon two important deeds among the various righteous deeds. These are not the most important deeds, but these are two very important deeds. That is exhorting people towards truth, that is doing da'wah, and exhorting people towards patience and perseverance. So these are the four criteria for a person to enter Jannah. And also for a person to enter Jannah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a must. It is very important. Without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no person, no believer will enter Jannah. So the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also it is very important. So we have need to have iman and we need to do righteous deeds. We need to do good deeds. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said it is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5673 that no one will enter Jannah only because of his good deeds. So the Sahaba, they asked our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, even you, O Prophet of Allah. So our beloved Prophet Muhammad, 
So our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, he said, even me, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wraps me in his mercy, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forgives me. So even our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will enter Jannah because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each and every believer will enter Jannah because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So besides having Iman and doing righteous deeds, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a requirement, it is a must for a person to enter Jannah. Because we human beings, we tend to commit errors, we tend to commit mistakes, we commit sins. And many times we do not realize it. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that every son of Adam, he errs, he commits mistakes. But the best of them are those who repent, those who ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that reminds me of an incident that is mentioned in the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, wherein a person, he will come on the day of judgment and he will have huge heaps of good deeds, of righteous deeds. And... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him before admitting him into Jannah that do you want to enter Jannah because of your good deeds or because of my mercy? So this person he will think and then he will respond and he will reply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will say, I want, to enter, uh, I want to enter Jannah because of my good deeds. My good deeds are a lot. They are huge heaps of good deeds. I want to enter Jannah because of my good deeds. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show him each and every sin that he committed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put it on the scale of evil deeds. And then his evil deeds will be more than his good deeds. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him that do you want to enter Jannah because of your good deeds or because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he will realize that it is due to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a person will be admitted into Jannah and including our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him even he will enter into Jannah because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he admit us into the gardens of paradise into Jannatul Firdaus Allahumma Ameen and also we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he have mercy on us and may he forgive our sins Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is of forgiving he is most merciful and this is mentioned in the glorious Quran in several places وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمَ and Allah is of forgiving most merciful in several places in the glorious Quran so a believer should never despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah we hope and we should always have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will have mercy on us and he will admit us into the gardens of paradise into Jannah. So I hope that answers your question. The next question. My name is Umama Suzain. I'm a student. If someone dies in an accident if someone dies in a car accident is he called as a shaheed as far as a person who is a shaheed who is a martyr based on the ahadith of our beloved prophet Muhammad may peace and blessings be upon him there are 10 categories of shaheed there are 10 categories of martyrs and these are based on a few ahadith of our prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the first hadith that is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari as well as in Sahih Muslim wherein five categories are mentioned in this hadith that the martyr are five the one who dies in a plague or because of a plague he is a martyr the one who dies because of a stomach complaint or a stomach ailment or pain in his stomach that is the second the third is the one who dies because of drowning the fourth is the one who dies if something falls on him and he crushes underneath it and the fifth is the one who dies while fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so five categories are mentioned in this hadith in another hadith our beloved prophet Muhammad may peace and blessings be upon him said Man qutila duna malihi fahuwa shaheed That the one who is killed while protecting his wealth or his property, he is a, he is a shaheed, he is a martyr. Wa man qutila duna deenihi fahuwa shaheed And the one who is killed while protecting his religion, his deen, he is a shaheed. 
وَمَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ دَمِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ and the one who is killed while protecting himself he is a shaheed وَمَنْ قُتِلَ دُونَ أَهْلِهِ فَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ the one who is protecting his family and he is killed in this situation he is a shaheed and another hadith of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that the woman who is pregnant and she dies along with her baby along with her child then she is a shaheed that is a woman is pregnant she has a baby in a womb and she dies maybe because of complication the pregnancy etc so the mother in this situation is a shaheed so 10 categories of shaheed are mentioned the ahadith of our prophet muhammad peace be upon him the first and the highest category are those people who fight that is do qital fight for fight for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So the first and the highest category are those people who fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is those who do qital. This is the highest category of shaheed and these people if they die as mentioned the hadith of Abilal Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him they are not even given a ghusl nor is the salatul janaza prayed upon them but rather they are buried as it is and this is as an honor for them. And in some hadith it is mentioned that the angels give them a ghusl. The second category of a martyr or a shaheed is the person who dies while serving the deen. For example, a person is a da'i, he's involved in conveying the message of Islam. A person is a scholar, he's involved in giving information about Islam. And because of this reason, someone kills him because he's involved in serving the deen. So he would be considered as a shaheed that is a martyr. And we have several such examples. We have the examples of previous scholars. For example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah have mercy on them. They were tortured and persecuted because they stuck to the deen. They did not compromise as far as the deen was concerned. And because of this, they were tortured and persecuted. We have examples of people who were even killed because they were involved in spreading the deen. So these people who are involved in spreading the deen of Islam, the dua, the da'is, as well as the scholars, and if they are killed because of this reason, they would be considered as a shaheed. The third category of shaheed, and all of the remaining categories, they are more related to worldly aspects. For example, a person may die in, because of drowning, a person may die because of a building falling on him, and he, and he may get crushed, etc. So the third category of a shaheed, of a martyr, is the person who dies of a plague or who dies because of a plague. The fourth category of a shaheed, of a martyr, is the person who dies because of a stomach complaint or a stomach ailment or because of pain in the stomach. The fifth category of a shaheed, of a martyr, is the person who dies out of drowning. The sixth category of a shaheed, of a martyr, is the person who dies if a building falls on him and he's crushed underneath it. The seventh category of a shaheed of a martyr is the one who dies while protecting his property or his wealth. The eighth category of a shaheed of a martyr is the one who dies while protecting himself. If someone attacks him and he protects himself in self-defense and if he dies he's considered as a martyr. The ninth category of a shaheed of a martyr is the one who dies while protecting his family. And the tenth category of a shaheed, of a martyr, is the mother who is pregnant and she dies along with her child, for example, due to situations wherein there's complication of pregnancy, etc. So the mother and the child that is in the womb, both of them, they pass away. So these are ten categories of shaheed. As far as your question is concerned, regarding a person dying in a car accident, so, would he be considered as a shaheed? As far as a person dying in a car accident is concerned, the scholars, they have said, certain scholars, that 
If a person is involved in a car accident wherein there is a vehicle roll over or he's crushed underneath the car, not all car accidents, but these certain car accidents wherein there's a vehicle roll over or he's crushed underneath the car. So they say that this would, he would fall into the same category of a martyr that is mentioned in the hadith of beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, that the one who dies when something falls on him and he's crushed underneath it. So certain scholars say that if a person dies in a car accident and he's crushed underneath the car or in a vehicle roll over, so in this situation he would fall into this category and they use qiyas that is analogy in this situation. Certain scholars say that if he dies in a car accident and if it is due to bleeding in his stomach, so he would come into the category of a person who dies due to pain in his stomach, so he would be a shaheed. But no one can say for sure that a person who dies in a car accident, he is a shaheed or he is a martyr. No one can say this for sure. So no one can say this for sure. But we hope that a person who dies in a car accident, he is from among the shaheed, he is from among the martyr, as the scholars have said, uh, in a vehicle roll over or if he's crushed underneath the car, we hope. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the most merciful. If he wishes, he can easily consider this person as a shaheed. But as I said earlier, no one can say for sure that he is a shaheed because this is not mentioned in the hadith of Bilal Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But certain scholars have done analogy and we hope and we pray that such a person would be a shaheed that is a martyr. But naturally, he would not be the same category of a martyr that is the person who fights for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he dies in the battlefield. And this person who dies in the battlefield while fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the highest category of a martyr, of a shaheed. The next question, my name is Shabaz. I'm from India, Mysore. Can we read Quran for a deceased person? If not, then what can we do for a deceased person? As far as reading the Quran for a deceased person is concerned, as far as reading the Quran for a deceased person is concerned, there is no verse of the glorious Quran nor any authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which mentions that we can do it. The Prophet did not do it, nor did the Sahaba do such a practice that when a person died, they read Quran upon him. And there is an important ruling in Islam that as far as ibadat are concerned, as far as acts of worship are con as far as acts of worship are concerned, things that are related to the deen, ibadat, we require proof to do anything as far as ibadat are concerned. For example. The Fajr prayer, the Fard prayer that we offer during the Fajr time, we offer two rakah of Fard Fajr prayer. Someone cannot say that three rakah is better than two rakah, so I will offer three rakah of Fard Fajr prayer. We do not have evidence for offering three rakah of Fard Fajr prayer. We have evidence for offering two rakah of the Fard Fajr prayer. As far as mu'amalat are concerned, the daily things which are not part of the deen, everything is permitted until proven otherwise, until it, there is a evidence which says that this is prohibited. For example, all food are permitted for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulu min tayyibat, that eat of the good things that we have provided for you. So all food are prohibited for us unless there is an evidence which says that a particular food is prohibited. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173, in Surah Al-Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3, in Surah Al-Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145, and in Surah Al-Nahl chapter number 16 verse number 115, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرُ وَمَا أُحُلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ Forbidden for you food are dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and any food, and any food on which any other name besides Allah's name has been taken. These types of food are 
these types of food are prohibited for us Muslims. So we have evidence that pocket is prohibited from the glorious Quran as far as reciting the glorious Quran on a dead person is concerned and we find this that this is very common in the Indian subcontinent. In the Indian subcontinent it is called as Quran Khani wherein they call a few people or a bunch of people and they give them one juice, two juice, three juice of the glorious Quran and they read the glorious Quran on the deceased person or on the person who has passed away thinking that it will benefit him. There is no evidence for this from the glorious Quran. There is no evidence for this from the glorious Quran, nor from the actions of the Prophet, nor from the actions of the Sahaba. And if it was a good action, the Sahabas would have done it. And imagine a person, he commits sins throughout his life, and when he passes away people, they recite Quran on him. What is the point? A person can do sins throughout his life and later when he dies, people recite Quran on him and his sins are forgiven and he's benefited. What is the point in this situation? This person, he has not even done the good deed himself that is reciting the glorious Quran. Someone else is reciting the glorious Quran on him. If it was so, everyone would do sins and after they would pass away, they would just tell their relatives that recite the Quran on me and it will benefit me or my sins will be forgiven. So this action, it should be avoided because there is no evidence for it from the glorious Quran or from the authentic teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. As far as what can we do, what will help the person who has passed away, the, the deceased person, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, that when the son of Adam passes away, all of his deeds are cut off except for three. إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعْ عَمَلُوا إِلَّا عَنْ ثَلَاثِ صَدَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ An ongoing charity. وَلَدٌ صَالِحْ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A pious child praying for him. And the third is عِلْمٌ يَنْتَفِعُ بِهِ Beneficial knowledge which he has left behind. So if a person really wants to benefit himself even after he has passed away or if you want to benefit someone after he has passed away so these are the three things that we can do a person he should try to give sadaqah that is charity and ongoing charity that will continue even after he passes away and he should give correct tarbiyah correct upbringing to his children so that after he passes away his children do dua for him and the pious child if he does dua for the father inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will accept the dua. It will benefit the father. And the third is, ilmun yantafi'u bihi. Beneficial knowledge that a person has left behind. And we have several examples. The best example we have of the best human being who ever walked on the face of the earth, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He left behind a legacy. What did he leave behind? Did he leave behind wealth? Did he leave behind? He did not even leave behind a son after he passed away. His sons died, his son died in his life. He left behind knowledge. He left behind a legacy. He left behind Sahaba who were torchbearers of the world. The same is the case with the Sahaba. They left behind beneficial knowledge, which people are benefiting from it even today. Even the Scholars who we have, the four Ahimma, what did they leave behind? They left behind beneficial knowledge, which people are benefiting from even today. So we should see to that we leave behind a legacy. A legacy that will benefit people and generations to come, even after we pass away. So these are the three things that will benefit a person even after he passes away among the righteous deeds, among the good deeds. We will take the next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Shaista Batul. I am a student from Gulbarga, India. I want to know the number of rakah of Sunnah, Ghair al muakkada prayer, and when are they supposed to be performed? 
And what is the difference between Sunnah Ghair al muakkada and the Nafil prayer? As far as the Sunnah that are offered before and after the five obligatory prayer, they can broadly be classified into two categories. The first is the Sunnah al muakkada which is the emphasized Sunnah. muakkada means emphasize or stress Sunnah and it is also called as the highly recommended Sunnah. And the second is the Sunnah Ghair al muakkada the Sunnah that is not stressed or not emphasized. It is a recommended Sunnah but it is not as recommended or it is not highly recommended like that of the Sunnah al muakkada so we have Sunnah al muakkada and the second is Sunnah Ghair al muakkada As far as the Sunnah al muakkada is concerned, the Prophet peace be upon him, he offered the Sunnah al muakkada before and after the five obligatory prayer, the prescribed Sunnah, he offered these on a regular basis. And he only missed these Sunnah al muakkada for a reason. For example, when he was traveling. And these prayers, they are Sunnah, they are highly recommended, they are not compulsory, they are not fard. As far as the Sunnah Ghair al muakkada are concerned, the Prophet peace be upon him, he offered these Sunnah Ghair al muakkada but he missed them without a reason. So he missed these prayers occasionally and it was without a reason. As far as the Sunnah al muakkada are concerned, there are 12 Sunnah al muakkada that are offered before and after the five obligatory prayer. And this is mentioned in the hadith of beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, wherein our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, that 12 raka are, that whosoever offers 12 raka in a day, that is the voluntary salah, voluntary prayer, he will have a house in Jannah. Referring to the 12 sunnah al muakkada two raka before the fajr prayer, 2 plus 2 raka before the Dhuhar prayer, 2 raka after the Dhuhar prayer. 2 raka after the Maghrib prayer and 2 raka after the Isha prayer. These are 12 Sunnah al muakkada As far as the Sunnah Ghair al muakkada are concerned, they are 10 in number. 10 rakas, 10 raka in a day. 2 raka after the Dhuhar prayer. So Two raka after the Dhuhar prayer are Sunnah al muakkada and additional two raka are Sunnah Ghair al muakkada Two rak four raka before the two plus two raka before the Asr prayer, two raka before the Maghrib prayer, and two raka before the Isha prayer. So these are ten Sunnah Ghair al muakkada so we should see to it that we are regular as far as offering the Sunnah al muakkada are concerned. These are more important and at the same time we should try our level best also to offer the Sunnah Ghair al muakkada Now the Sunnah Ghair al muakkada it generally refers to the prayer or the voluntary prayer, prayers that are offered before and after the five obligatory prayers. What is the difference between Sunnah Ghair al muakkada and the Nafil prayer? Nafil prayer it is generally any prayer that is offered. For example, a person may offer two raka in order to ask guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person may offer two raka in order to ask help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person may offer Salatul Istisqa, Salatul Khusuf, Salatul Qusuf. Certain scholars say Salatul Duha, it is Sunnah al muakkada Certain scholars say it is not Sunnah al muakkada so the other sunnah, the other salah which we offer, they are the nafil prayer besides the sunnah ghair al muakkada which are offered before and after the five obligatory prayer. So I hope that answers the question. We will take the next question. Is it forbidden to tie our hair during Salah and are there any other rules while we are offering Salah if we have long hair? I will greatly appreciate if you reply to my question. Tying the hair behind your head and this is referring to men tying their hair behind their head in the Salah or collecting their hair, braiding their hair and 
tying it behind their head during the salah, during the prayer. Regarding this, it is mentioned in the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, wherein Abdullah ibn Abbas, he saw Abdullah ibn al-Harith, who was offering salah, and he had tied his hair behind his head. He had long hair and he had collected his hair and he had tied it behind his head. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, while Abdullah ibn al-Harith was offering salah, he started untying his hair. So Abdullah ibn al-Harith, after he completed the salah, he was wondering why, is, why did Abdullah ibn Abbas do such an act? Why did he untie his hair during the salah? And he asked Abdullah ibn Abbas that, what do you have to do with my hair? Why did you untie my hair during the salah? So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that I heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, say that the one who ties his hair behind his head during the salah is like the one who has tied his hands behind his shoulders. In another hadith, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the one who ties his hair behind his head, it is like the person who has tied his hand behind his shoulders. So based on this, the scholars, they say that it is makru to tie your hair behind your head or to collect your hair and to tie it together while you are offering salah, while you are offering prayer. And they say this, the reason is that because when you prostrate, you are supposed to prostrate on your parts of the body and therefore your hair should be left open when you prostrate so that your hair can touch the ground or your hair should be left open in this situation. And based on this hadith, they say that it is makru to tie your hair behind your head while offering salah. But the scholars, they say it is makru, it is discouraged. But naturally, it does not reach the category of haram based on the opinion of the scholars. So inshallah, we hope that it would not fall into the category of haram. And inshallah, you will not be committing a sin. But the best option is that if a person has long hair or if you have long hair, that you keep it open while you're offering your salah, while you're offering your prayer. And this is a better, better thing to do. We will take the next question. Assalamu alaikum, dear Farak Naik. I have a question regarding divorce. That is the divorce that takes, if a divorce takes place, whenever a husband is not willing to give divorce but is forced to give divorce on a gunpoint. His parents want him to give divorce and he then signed on divorce papers. What is the status of this divorce? If a person is forced to give divorce, for example, he's threatened or a gun is put on his head and he's forced to give divorce. So in this situation, the majority of the scholars, they say that divorce, it is not considered in this situation. Because a person is forced in this situation. And we know this based on verses of the glorious Quran. Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Illa maturitum ilay. Except if you are compelled to do it. And the general ruling in Islam is that if a person is forced to do something, for example, if a person is forced to leave the religion of Islam, someone is threatening him and telling him, that if you do not leave Islam, so I will kill you. Or someone puts a gun on his head and tells him that if you do not leave Islam, I will kill you. So in this situation, the scholars, they say that he can verbally say that he does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or he does not believe in Islam, but in his heart, but naturally he needs to maintain his iman and his iman needs to be strong. But verbally he can say this, that he does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to save himself in this situation because he is threatened that he will be killed. Similar is the case if a person is, if a person, he is dying out of hunger and he does not find any food. And the only food that is available that will save him, that will save his life, it is pork. So in this situation, he is permitted to eat pork only to save his life and only that particular amount which will save his life. Because here he's, he does not have any other option. So similarly, if a husband is forced to give divorce, 
whether it be a verbal divorce or whether it be a written divorce and someone has pointed a gun on his head or someone has threatened him that he will torture him, he will persecute him. So in this situation, even if he gives divorce, the divorce, it is not counted. It is not considered whether it be a verbal divorce or whether it be a written divorce as rightly said by the majority of the scholars. So I hope that answers the question. We will take the last question. If according to Islam, messengers or prophets were sent to each and every nation of the world, then which prophet was sent to India? Can we consider Ram and Krishna to be messengers of God? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, and there's not a nation to whom we have sent a warner or a guide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 7, had, and to each nation we have sent a guide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Surah Al-Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 164. وَرُسُلًا قَدْ قَصَصْنَاهُمْ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلْ وَرُسُلًا لَمْ نَقْصُصُمْ عَلَيْكَ And messengers, some whose stories we have related to thee, some whose stories we have narrated to thee, and some whose stories we have not narrated to thee. By name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran and in the authentic ahadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49, وَرَسُولًا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ and a messenger to the children of Israel. So, by name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran and the authentic ahadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For example, Adam, Noah, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Adam, peace be upon him, Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him. By name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran and in the authentic teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him. But besides this, there were other prophets and other messengers of God. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it is mentioned in Mishkat al Masabih, volume number 3, hadith number 5737, that there were 12400,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. But all the prophets, all the messengers that were sent before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only meant for those people and for that time. The last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was not sent only for the Muslims, or only for the Arabs, but he was sent for the whole of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he is not the father of any of you men but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets so Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was sent for the whole of humanity Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the glorious Quran Surah Al Anbiya chapter number twenty one verse number one hundred seven وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning men against sin. But most of them did not understand. So all the prophets that were sent before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only meant for those people and for that time. Now coming back to your question that which prophet was sent to India? There is no verse in the, of the glorious Quran nor any authentic hadith which tells us that which prophet was sent to India. And regarding Ram and Krishna, were they prophets of God or were they messengers of God? There is no verse in the glorious Quran nor any authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, which tells us that Ram and Krishna, they were messengers or prophets of God. 
And we find this, it is common in India that many of the Muslims, the politicians, in order to appease the non-Muslims or in order to have a political up in order to have a political advantage, when they are trying to convince or appease the Hindus or the non-Muslims, they say Ram alayhi salam. This is totally wrong. There is no evidence from the glorious Quran or from the authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him which tells us that Ram and Krishna they were prophets of God so if someone asks me that were they prophets of God I say maybe they were maybe they were not I do not know since there is no evidence from the glorious Quran or authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him I cannot say that they were I can not say that they were prophets of God. They may be, they may not be. I cannot say for sure that they were prophets of God. But even if I agree with you that they were prophets of God, they were only meant for those people and for that time. We have to follow today the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in whichever part of the world we are in whether we are in India, whether we are in Pakistan, whether we are in USA we have to follow the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad may peace and blessings be upon him so I hope that answers the question with this I would like to conclude the question answer session wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen